We're going to read Scripture. It's lengthy. Um, Psalm 35. So stay with me. Lengthy meaning 27, 28 verses. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but to set the tone for this, uh, this is an imprecatory psalm. And if you're not familiar with that term, most people are not. It is a psalm in which the author calls down curses upon people. And you're going to go, why are these in Scripture? So listen to it, hear it, hear what David has to say, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail to hopefully describe it in a way that makes it make sense for why he indoctrinated it into Scripture and how it applies to our lives. So hear now the reading of God's Word from Psalm 35. Of David, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise up for my help. Draw the spear and the javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All of my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and the needy from him who robs him? Malicious witnesses, they rise up. They ask me of, they ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. <clears throat> I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, at my stumbling, they rejoiced. And they gathered, and they gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me with, without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those who those wink the eye who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace. But against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointment altogether, who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of His servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. This is the reading of God's Word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Transform us by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Today we'll conclude our series in the Summer of Psalms. Uh, we have a guest preacher next week, and then we will jump into 
the uh, book of Jeremiah. And I think it's very fitting because Jeremiah goes to the southern kingdom of, of Israel and says, or Judah, and says, look around you, your head, the northern kingdom has already been taken away and you continue in your sin. Don't you think God's going to deal with you the same way? And Jeremiah is like pleading with a society that just laughs at him and mocks him. Not only that, he has prophets in the kingdom of Israel telling everybody that he's a fool and that he's wrong. So I think it's very fitting for our day and age because we feel that way in many ways. And so we will study the book of Jeremiah together and hear what God had to say to the kingdom of Israel uh, when they turned against him into sin. But today we are in Psalm chapter 35, or book 35, of the, Psalm 35, if I should say that correctly. Uh, and today it's an imprecatory psalm. If you want to see how to spell that word, imprecatory. The author of an imprecatory psalm, there are so, many of these, like, 13, 20, I'm not sure the exact number, depends on what source you look at or what they define as an imprecatory psalm. But it's one in which the author calls down calamity or destruction and, and God's anger and his judgment on his enemies, on the enemies of the author. And you, you saw that David was like, hey, go get them. Go get them, Lord. Take them out. And what David asked for in this psalm was not just take them out, but he said, God, will you, and Yahweh, because God revealed himself to Israel as Yahweh, call me Yahweh. Um, he says, will you bring the full force of heaven against my enemies? Because an enemy of me is an enemy of you. Why is that? Now, remember who David was. This uh, Several commentaries say this one, this psalm was in reference to David being chased by Saul. So, Quick history lesson to get us all in in the same story. We've heard it several weeks, but I just want to kind of keep reiterating it. David was called and anointed to be king while Saul was still king. Saul was the first king of Israel, and he disobeyed God. So God said, you're no longer going to be king. Your son is not going to be king after you. And Saul was like, I don't really like that. And he anointed David king. You remember the story as a little kid, he, he passes all these big brothers of David through and they're, they're like, no, not that one. God said, no, not that one. He goes, it's almost like he says, I got this little puny kid out in the woods. What do you want me to do with him? It's not how he says it. But he's like, yeah, bring him. And he wasn't anything to look at. He wasn't strong looking compared to his brothers. He didn't have the, he just didn't have what his brothers had physically, the look and appearance of a leader. And God said, that's the one I want. And he anointed him. Samuel said, you are the next king of Israel. Didn't make him king now, but when Saul leaves this world, you will be the king. David used to be friendly with them, best friends with Jonathan, Saul's son, and ate in their house and played music for him and helped Saul when when his mind was distressed. Then Saul found out about this, and they said, David's out to take your kingship, your leadership, your place. So Saul chased him and hunted him. And David, in the midst of this, writes this and says, God, will you've anointed me. I'm listening to your authority. You want me to be king next. And all these people are fighting against that. They are rebelling against your authority as God to do what you want to do. Will you fix that for me? Will you contend for me? Will you? Well, there's the definition. I didn't switch that slide. Um, will you contend for me? Will you fight for me? Will you, verse 2, rise up to help me? Will you, he says in verse 5, send the angel of the Lord, which is a, a, a angel of the Lord is Old Testament language to speak to the pre-incarnate Christ. Will you send him to drive them away? Not only that, he didn't say just drive them away. He says, like chaff in the wind, you know that loose chaff that just blows with wind? He says, will you send the angel of the Lord to chase them? When they're fleeing, don't go, well, we won. Chase them into utter destruction. Remove them from my presence. See, what was happening, not only was Saul out to get him, but he was convincing the kingdom that David was usurping his power and his throne. So David's talking about all these people that have looked upon me as though I'm not innocent. I'm innocent in this. I didn't do anything. He's not saying I'm a perfect individual, but he's saying, in the grand scheme of it, you called me, so you need to fix it, God. It's kind of what he's saying. He says, will you fix this? Much more respectful. But he's saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning upon the promises that you made. Will you come and pursue them out of my kingdom? So, this is the question I was trying to get to. Why would David write a hymn 
for the congregation to sing that curses his enemies. I was talking to the youth in Sunday school. Wouldn't it be awkward if I came in and go, I've got this new hymn. And we're going to say, would you kill the enemies of Rick? Those people that are after Rick, will you take them out? I mean, you'd be like, the session would be like, I'm not sure we need to be singing this one, Rick. So <laughs> I've got another amen out there. Um, so why did, I mean, and you think about what the Psalms are. He introduced these into the song book in the temple, in the, in, the, in the life of Israel. So why is that? Why would he have these imprecatory psalms, these calling down of curses, entered into the psalm? I mean, I can understand him wanting to write it, a poetry, laying out his heartfelt desire, pleas to God for personal help. But he introduced this into the life of Israel. Why is that? Well, if we look again at it, and we, we think it the big picture, we might notice that it's actually another Old Testament presentation of the gospel. Follow me. David is God's chosen king for Israel. Israel is the kingdom of God on earth in, in that day and age. So David is a type of Christ. He isn't the Christ. He's not the savior of the world, but he is a, a shadow of the reality who Christ is. King of God's people, leading them, chosen for the task, placed in the role, anointed for it, but didn't quite take that role immediately, took time to get there. Christ walked through these same steps and stages. And in verse 4, David says, let those who um, seek my life, let them be put to shame and dishonor and let destruction come upon them. Is that not exactly what happens to the enemies of Christ? Now, the offer to not be an enemy of Christ is out there for anyone to receive. But for those who continue in that rejection of God and of Christ and His free offer of salvation, the ultimate end is to be damned for all of eternity in hell. That's heavy. But is that not exactly what David is saying on a much lighter note? Because he's talking about this earthly kingdom, which is a shadow of the heavenly kingdom. He says, I'm the chosen one, God. Will you take those out and move them to destruction? Get them out of here. On the flip side of that, he says, but not everybody's following Saul. Some have heard you, have listened to my pleas when I go share with them that God anointed me the next king He's the, he's the one that's against God. There are some who have delighted in my righteousness. There are some who have looked upon me and said, you're right, David, I will support you against the kingdom of evil. And David says, for those, will you let them shout for joy and be glad? Is this not a precursor to the gospel? Do we not go out and say, and ought we not to say, you, all of humanity, are under the curse of sin, enemies of God, deserving of His wrath because the wages of sin is death. Well, how do I avoid death? God says, I have a solution for you. I will cover your sin with the blood of Christ, cleanse you, wash you. He uses all this imagery to say, if you are in Christ, if you delight in the righteousness of Christ and clothe yourself with the righteousness of Christ, then you will shout for joy and you will be glad forever and ever, and ever. So what David has done, he's not asked Israel to curse Saul long after Saul's dead. He has built into the ecosystem and life of Israel this realization, there's two sides. Are you for God or are you against them? And if you're against him, the angel of the Lord will eventually come and chase you away like chaff blows away in the wind. Christ is the chosen king for God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Destruction comes upon his enemies, but his friends are joyful forever. So Psalm 35 is a call to submit to God's power and authority. David is entering into the hymn book of the, 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 the Israel, Old Testament church, if you will, He's entering in this book, this hymn that says, let's sing about our submission to God's authority 
our recognition of David, God's anointed one as king, and our call for God to be our help and our savior in times of trouble, recognizing that when we rejoice in God's salvation, that we are the ones who are right with the Lord. And that's why he says in verse 3, Will you say to my soul, O God, repeat to me over and over, I am your salvation. David's going, I'm lost. What do I do? I, and David became a great warrior king. So he had it in him to go fight back and destroy Saul probably. I mean, I don't know about the weight of the kingdom at the time if he could have. But he had it in his heart to follow God into battle. And he says, will you always remind me that you are my salvation? Now, with that as the background and story of why the psalm is there, and if it truly is a psalm that David's calling and reminding the people of Israel to submit to God's authority, that's what it is. Submit to what God has put in place, recognize it, and honor that. The question we ask ourselves is, am I, me and you, are we at risk of rebellion? Let's think about this life for a moment. I, I would contend that we are taught nowadays, at least in early life, to at least question authority, if not outright deny the authority in our lives. Um, it's just kind of ingrained in the media that we consume. Um, I would even contend that our educational practices of taking kids out of the home earlier and earlier, what we're training, unintended consequences of that is teaching children, where do you get educated? Where do you learn? Not from your parents. And it's, it's, it's a good thing to, to teach them very well, but an unintended consequence, even in the church, like the church sets up Sunday school, the church does all these things. Well, what happens is parents a lot of times go, that's taken care of, and they give up the responsibility of teaching in the home. And so it's, it's an unintended consequence, but what we're teaching children in their minds is that you go outside of the home to learn. The authority of your parents then is beginning to be undermined. Let's take it to something a little less controversial. We all hate the president, whichever president it is, right? I'm, I'm not talking about the one we have now. I'm talking about everybody hates a president at some point in their life. There's no controversy in that. But what has happened is, I believe, historically, there were a little bit more arguments over the ideologies of the, of the person in charge, whereas we have begun to trend now towards well, that person's just an ugly, stupid person, and you shouldn't like him. We go, yes, I don't like that ugly, stupid person. It becomes about the person, and we've, we've failed to respect the authority of the office. Now, there's some foolishness that happens within the authority of the office, and we're going, how could this happen? But by, by goodness, Saul was trying to kill the next anointed king. Of, how foolish can you get? And then David, in the middle of this psalm, says, listen to what I, I was praying for them. When they were sick, it hurt me in my very bones. I was sick. It was like my own mother was dying when they were sick. I was trying to, to pray for them and care for them. He's talking about these people that are chasing him and trying to kill him. We don't have that today because the respect of authority in our society has been eroded for so long that we rebel against everything. <clears throat> Go to a kid's soccer, baseball, football game and watch as the umpires and, and the people in authority over the game are just chastised and undermined. And I know it happens because I've done it and I've been convicted of it. They've been placed here to keep the game in order. Let them do their job and, and respect their authority, even if they're terrible at it. If you want to do it better, go get that job. Go through the hoops to get there. So are we at risk of rebellion? I would say in our society, we are always challenged to rebel against authority. It's been the problem from the very beginning. What did Adam do? It was unbelief. You should not eat this. The serpent challenged the authority of God, and Adam went, I think I'll choose this one. At that instant, Adam's authority figure, he became his own authority, the one making decisions, not God. And that's been the curse and the battle ever since. It rears its head in different ways. And today what we see is that unbelief is, is rampant in our society. It's everywhere. Unbelief in God. And, and I believe that unbelief is actually rooted in rejection of God's authority. 
I'm rejecting him as my authority, so I don't believe your word. I don't believe your moral system. I don't believe your church, your leaders, the Christian friend that's calling me to repentance. I don't believe him. Who are you to tell me how to live my life? Who are you to tell me what is right and wrong? And all of this has been a, a, a continual theme throughout society. And the evidence that unbelief is rampant in our uh in our society, look at the churches. They're becoming like the churches of England, empty. We had a uh, one of the elders of a church in England come stand right here in this spot seven or eight years ago. And he said, I'm trying to talk to people in America to tell them what it's like. He said, he, I, I don't even know his age. He's probably in his 60s. I can't remember at this point. But uh, he said... Um, the church was there when I was when I was younger, and then one day we turned around and there's nobody younger than us in the church, and now they're all museums. He said, "I'm here to warn America because the problem is you guys are doing it, and you're much better at destroying the church than we are. It's happening faster, and here we are going. What happened over the last five to ten years? Right? Is that not the question we're asking? The church has been undermined and uprooted in many ways by unbelief of our society creeping itself in and causing church members to go." I don't know that I believe that to be true. And begin not questioning in a healthy way, looking to God to answer it, but questioning in an unhealthy way, going, let's get God out of the way and let me see what I believe. Placing authority within myself. Unbelief is rampant in our society. It's rampant in our churches. You want to know the evidence that distrust in God's authority is rampant in our churches? Just ask yourself, how many times this week did you pray for our political leaders? Versus how many times did you get disgusted with them about something we read online? Guilty. We spend most of our time in angst and anger rather than listening to God's authority who says, pray for those whom I have placed over you. He doesn't say pray for the ones that are smart and good because we know there are none of those. I say that tongue-in-cheek because we don't like... Nobody likes authority. Every decision that's made goes against something I would do, but we're called to submit to it and pray for God to contend for us when foolishness rises to the top and becomes an authority in our lives. This unbelief that creeps into the church, it starts slowly, and then it starts to rear its head with this idea that I can appease unbelief. If I can just appease them, these people that are saying, I don't believe this to be true, I believe that this, is, this teaching of the church historically is wrong, that, that uh, it's too rigid of a system to say you have to come every Sunday and give up. Look, I've got life to live. I don't have time. Why should I not do all of these things on Sunday and work? I don't, it's, it's rejecting the authority of God. To, he's saying, you need rest in me. And we're going, I don't, I don't know. But all of these things wrap up and to say what the church tends to end up doing is to try to appease those who show uh, unbelief in their, in their system rather than giving that clarion call to repent. We forget to call to repent. I had an article sent to me this week about um, the idea that the church has been saying, hey, let's be winsome, let's be winsome, let's be winsome. And, and, and what happens is when you have things like winsomeness that come up and uh, they get very popular in the church of a way to reach people. It starts off with really what they're saying is be gentle and loving and kind in your presentation of the gospel. And you're talking to people that are just slightly removed from the church and it works. But over time, the people in, uh, that, that are, were in the church begin to get further and further away from the church and your winsomeness goes starts to chase them. And it's no longer about a gentle, kind and loving presentation of the gospel. It's about doing anything you can to appease them to make them happy with the church, well, you, you lose the gospel because the call to repentance is lost and muddied in that. And so there's a distrust of God's authority within the church and it creeps into the leadership of the church. Now, circling back around, are we then at risk of rebellion against God's authority? And I would answer yes, every single day. Paul expresses it this way. He says, I'm the worst of sinners. Some translations, I'm the chief of sinners. He said, I was out killing Christians. I am the utter worst. 
But what Paul is really trying to express to us is the closer and closer I draw to God, the more and more I realize how much my sin created a chasm between He and I, between the both of us, I mean. And he, 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 he calls us in another part of Scripture to put off our former way of life that's been corrupted by deceitful desire. So are we at risk of rebellion? Paul says, yes. You're at risk of denying God's authority in your life every single day because we live in societies that are rooted in the fall, which was a rejection of God's authority, and it just rears its head in different ways throughout uh, create throughout history. He warns us in Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive de- philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. God's authority says lean upon Christ. But that's not what we do. And Paul warns us about that. The visible church has always had people and even pastors the visible church being what we see, not the, the ones that are truly Christians, but all those who join the church who may or may not actually have faith uh, in their heart. The visible church has always had people and even pastors that were willing to set aside God's truth in an attempt to appeal to those who have rejected God's truth. In the 19th and 20th century, it was a rebellion against miracles. Science took off and we all these discoveries and we were we were smarter and the churches went around and looked and go, man, all these really smart people that are that are getting into science, some, they're not going to believe in miracles because the world has now said, if I can't see it, touch it and prove it, it's not real. So two things happened. Some in the church went, well, we've got to change the message and make it appeal to their unbelief. They didn't say it that way, but that's what happened over time. Others in the church said, Scripture calls them out as miracles. We must hold fast to this. This church didn't die. It still exists today because God is the one sustaining it. In the 20th and 21st century, one of the things that's being challenged greatly is Scripture being the only rule and practice of our lives. People go, man, that's an old book. You sure people writing a thousands of years ago can tell me in this day and age of of great technological advancements, they had a word to tell me how to live? Who gets to tell me how to live? Not that dusty old book that you don't even ever read, oh church. And they start to question the authority of Scripture. They start to undermine it going, it's not really the Word of God. You think God wrote that? And we go, well, maybe not. How can we make our message appeal to the unbelief of our age? We need to be more winsome. We need to, if we're just more likable, then they'll come and be a part of us. Well, church, how is that working out for us? This is not a call to go beat people over the head and tell them they're stupid, ignorant. We ought to respond in love. But there has to be a clear and crisp gospel presentation, which is a call to repentance. So are we at risk of rebellion? Yes. We are in the midst of it because we are all called to be ambassadors for Christ. Yet we're scared to death, don't know what to say. We don't talk to people about Christ. We are in rebellion because we're not trusting God to do what He's called us to do. This is a wake-up call for us to realize we're, we're not okay. We think we still live in the Bible belt where everyone's Christians. They're just not coming to church. We're not okay. We are not okay in this church, in any church. And this is not like you're horrible people. I'm saying we as a people have strayed from the Lord. And David sees the same thing happening in his society. And he says, wake up, return to me. And when I say we're not okay, what I mean is how do you think the following subsequent generations are going to go if we keep the path that we're happening, that's happening? Something needs to turn Something needs to change. And we're pleading with God to change us, transform us. David, he said, God, I need you to fight for me. So we need to cry out to God. God, this is your church. This is your kingdom that you're building. Cry out to God to fight for us as we wait for that eternal day where we will see him face to face. So David trusted Yahweh, and that's what he's telling us. He's telling his people, look, I don't know how this is going to play out, David says. I didn't put myself in this position. 
but you got to trust God. And by trusting God, that means look at him as the authority in your life. And if he says something in Scripture, it is his word. Take it and live it and believe it and do everything you can to focus your eyes and your heart and your mind on the word of God. And here's the beauty of it. Because you may feel chastised like, oh my goodness, I'm terrible. We're not doing a good job. God never expected us to be perfect at this. And history has waves where the church is strong in certain countries and it wanes in certain countries. All He wants to have happen is for a wake-up call for people to repent. But then David says this in verse 18. As we, oh, this, this is the section I'm on. Sorry, we need to keep watch over ourselves. Um, I forgot to introduce that third topic. Uh, at verse 18, he says, I will thank you and the great congregation in the mighty throng. I will praise you. So David had all of Israel crying out to God, one day you're going to chase our enemies away and we will be in a mighty throng. And I thought, well, that's a weird word. I don't use that word very often, like never, unless I'm talking about something in Psalm 35. Um you look it up though, and it's a it's the tight it's such so many masses of people that they're tucked in. The closest I can think of is when I was watching fireworks on New Year's Eve at uh, Disney World. You can't move. They're like you get there, you're stuck, and or no, worse yet, you go to um, uh, New York on uh, New Year's Eve. Don't do it. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> You've got to go to the restroom. They've got you in these little squares. You can't get out. It's terrible. But you're packed in. And he says, one day, David says, what you're witnessing, there will be so many of us packed in together. I don't know that we'll be packed because heaven's going to be vast. And, you know, that's my picture in my head. But he said, we're not going to be alone. If you feel alone as a Christian right now and you feel like I'm just fighting this uphill battle, God says, I've got you. I am contending for you. And the end of all of this is that you will be one of millions and bajillions, that's not even a number, of people and voices praising God. So stay steadfast and wait on me. So while God contends against our enemy, which our enemy is not the people and the sinners around us and the people tempting us, our enemy is death. Our enemy is sin, but it's not flesh and blood. It's the principalities and darkness of this evil age. He says, I am am your salvation. So what do we do while we wait? While we listen to what the Spirit says, I am your salvation. And while we wait for Him to contend for our souls, we love our enemies. Verses 12 through 14 give us a picture of this. He says, those people, they repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning. Love your enemies. Love those who hate you. Pray for them. Seek the gospel in their lives, the salvation of the gospel in their lives, because it's not hopeless, but man, it's hard. When people speak to you unkindly, they're not nice, they're, they hate your God, they hate what you love about God, it becomes very frustrating. But David says, I, I didn't let that affect me. And then the second, second thing is feast on things that exalt God's authority in our lives. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He says a few other things, and then in verse 9 of Philippians 4, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Amen. So, how do we set our minds on the things of God? Well, as I'd like to say luck would have it, but providence would have it, uh, the Galloways have gifted the church with books um, today. They've been working on it, and it is 31 days of praise. And so they've asked us to join with them as a congregation. The books are in the back, each family, one per family. But if you have, there are a few extras if you need to give one out to someone uh, in another family. Um, and 
it's 31 days of praise, fixing our minds upon God, upon Christ as our authority, as our praise. And the hope is that as you begin to praise God more, we will then again to be a praying people more and more. So let's join together and do that. Can we commit to that? 31 days, this, the month of September, which only has 30 days, but that's okay, right? <laughs> One to grow on. Um, let's, let's do that. Let's do that together as a family. Let me pray for us. And then we have uh, the great joy this morning of receiving a communicant uh, into our congregation to the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And we praise your name. And we pray that our praise would increase and grow and our trust in you would increase and grow, and our recognition of your authority in our lives would grow and grow and grow, and our submission to you would increase and grow. Father, that's our hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.